This is one of those occasions where I sort of I, I kind of wish that we'd seen the presentations before, um, because all I think I'm going to say now is uh, is I agree with everything that, that has come before. Uh, if I take the points out of the previous presentation, the power of compounding, the fact that growth versus value is too simplistic a message, message, long term holding, the power of earnings and the importance of earnings, the consistency uh, of approach and process, and the fact that Chernobyl's a great TV series, uh, I agree with with all of those. And so I think when we look through the um, look through the presentation, I think I'm going to actually uh, be repeating some of the same messages. Uh, in terms of what investors should look for in a market uh, and the things that, that that I think should be considered, the things we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about growth versus value. Uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of valuation, or actually what I think is the lack of importance about valuation. Uh, I'm going to talk about the fact you need an opportunity set. And I'm going to talk about the fact that you need a proven and consistent process and you need to know what you're buying and that your fund manager sticks resolutely to what they say they're going to do. If we start, as all things should, with a long term performance chart, this is uh, the performance of UK smaller companies uh, since 1955. Uh, and this is about the power of compounding. I've always had this chart in my presentations in one form or another. I've been covering smaller companies for 20 years. I've been running smaller company money for, for 15 years. And this chart has always, uh, has always featured. It goes back to 1955, uh, which admittedly is a 65 year holding period, but ultimately most people should be thinking about 65 year holding periods for their investments or certainly a 65 year uh, investment horizon. And this shows what would have happened if you'd invested £100 in small cap and in large cap over that time period. Unfortunately for me, the numbers are now really easy. Your £100 becomes £100,000 if you'd invested in, in, uh, in large cap. It becomes a million pounds if you'd invested in small cap. You know, that is the return, the consistent or the, the compounding return that has been uh, generated over that 65 year period. Now, importantly, what really stands out here, whilst that looks like a very large number, it's only 4% compound return. And the vast majority of that return has come from the fact that small and mid cap stocks tend to grow their earnings greater than large cap stocks. Three quarters of that 4% has come from just the earnings growth that these companies can deliver uh, over time. And the second thing to draw from the chart is when you look at the orange line, the million pounds you'd have if you'd invested in UK small cap so wisely back in 1955, most market turnarounds and changes and sell-offs, whether it be the global financial crisis, whether it be COVID, whether it be you know, 87, whether it be dot-com, they're blips. And at the time, they feel awful. You know, they're incredibly difficult things to invest through. Uh, they're very challenging times to invest through, not just for us as fund managers, but you as underlying investors in terms of how do you manage your money and react around those market conditions. It's important to remember for long-term investors that these things are blips. And ultimately what we're trying to do is find businesses that can transcend the economic conditions and can grow through time. And again, to agree with Stephen's previous presentation, earnings growth is what dictates share prices. We think about our initial holding period for any company as three to five years. You know, that is the time scale that we are putting on them. But ultimately, we're hoping that we can own them for much longer than that. Uh, this portfolio can't buy anything above 2 billion market cap in our smaller companies investment trust. We can hold stocks above that, although we won't if they go into FTSE 100. But ultimately, we are looking for long holding periods because in the long term, it's earnings that matter. So if you look at the three month chart on the left hand side, roughly three quarters of the return on a stock over a short time period comes from the multiple. In this case, we've used EBITDA, but it could be anything. And that is about sentiment. It's about flow. It's about the traditional market drivers of fear and greed. Those are what go into short term share price performance. And ultimately, we don't care about it. We care about the right hand side of the graph as you look at it, the five year period and, and beyond. We care about what happens to share prices because of what's happened to the long term earnings growth of those businesses. Over longer holding periods, the short term sentiment, fear and greed, it's less relevant for share prices. It's about what companies do. It's about companies delivering on earnings. And ultimately, this is why we think you want to invest in growth, because if you're investing in earnings streams that grow, you are by default investing in share prices that grow. 
I think it's worthwhile thinking about growth versus value. You know, we all get references to Ben Graham thrown back at us as, as fund managers. The idea of the value investor, that, that is a philosophy that, that works over the long to, longer term. Now, we don't agree with that for a number of reasons. One, if you're investing in small cap, which obviously we do as a small cap investment team, we just think that you are taking a liquidity risk. You're taking other things in small cap. So why would you invest in value? The very nature of investing in small cap businesses is you're trying to buy businesses that can become larger. So ultimately, we think it's a growth asset class or an asset class that should look towards growth investment. But secondly, we think that the growth value debate is very static. And actually, growth companies have shifted quite a lot over time. In a, a, another reference to the previous slide, we'll start looking at some historic growth companies, and IBM is one of these. So this chart is going to look at what happens from the 10 years after these businesses achieve their first $2 billion of revenue. So IBM, 60s and 70s, all about mainframes. High capital employed businesses, actually quite difficult, even though it's seen as a growth business, actually quite difficult to grow that business because it takes a lot of capital, it takes a lot of capex. The cost of incremental return was very high. Fortunately, we've now all seen a picture of an IBM mainframe, so we have a view of the scale and size and the, the commitment that those things have. We then have Apple and Microsoft. And you can see that the trajectory post that first two billion of revenue is much quicker and much greater. The simple reason, the capital dynamics of those businesses were slightly different. More importantly, they were building on the successes of the past. IBM's mainframe business was in a world where personal computing was a dream. The idea that everyone would have a computer on their desk, that was the work of science fiction. And clearly now we know that that's more science fact than science fiction. So Apple and Microsoft could build on the on the base that IBM gave them before. Then we had Google. We're moving through the decades. And Google's growth, well, Google's growth was supercharged because it was building on the work that Apple and Microsoft had done to make sure that there was a desktop computer on every desk in both offices and homes. So the world of computing had changed by the time that Google came about. The ability to scale quickly onto that existing infrastructure and real estate of desktop computers that themselves had scaled because of the work that IBM did before meant the growth rate was much greater. And then moving on, Facebook. Facebook has grown at a much quicker pace again. And again, it's built on the fact that Google has come before it and Microsoft before it and IBM before it. I'm repeating the pattern as you can see, but the point here is that the growth trajectory of companies has changed. And Facebook now enables other companies to grow. It's possible to launch a consumer product internationally, globally, at the same time, which has never been done before. You know, historically, to launch a product, you did it in a single market and then you rolled out into different markets. Now you can launch on the same day internationally using the power of Facebook as your marketing medium, using the power of Amazon Web Services and Google to power your computing, using the Microsoft and the Apple uh, work from before. Everyone has the phone in their hand. Everyone has access to this information. Everyone can see these new products. So using arguments about growth versus value and the valuation of different asset classes is less relevant over time because these businesses change their operations and their structures. They become lower capital employed, higher return on capital. The incremental cost of growth is lower per pound of capex. And so businesses change and therefore so should investment philosophy. So this is the growth and the opportunity set. Let's bring it back to the UK. Um, why the UK market? Well, the UK is still cheap. So this chart goes back to May 2021. And you can see at that point, the green bars are the 10 year range of uh, PE. And it's the, the 20th to 80th percent range, the quintile ranges. And you can see that the ratios for 21 and 22 are all out of the top of those bars. Valuations at the start of this year were reflecting the fact that post COVID, we were going to see an earnings recovery, we we're going to see consistent and sustained upgrades in the expectations of stocks. And so that was reflected in the valuation. There was hope, there was anticipation in those, in those values. And you can see where the UK sits in this a lot less hope, a lot less anticipation. You know, Brexit, poorly um, dealing with coronavirus, other things that were going on within the UK economy as well as the structure and shape of the UK large cap market that dictates so much uh, of this valuation. We're very much against the UK. And now move forward. Move forward to the end of November. What's really happened? Well, the UK still looks cheap. And actually, compared to its own history, the UK looks even cheaper. So either the earnings growth has come through and justified the valuations, or there is still earnings growth to come through. The UK market looks cheap. And actually, 
in terms of its place within global markets, not much has changed. Brexit still hanging over, relations with, with Europe still hanging over. And whilst we had started to see international fund managers come back to UK, so on the right hand side, the bars beneath the x-axis show the weighting of international managers to UK equities. It has been consistently an underweight sector since 2014 and the announcement of the Brexit referendum. Uh, and actually, in more recent months, we've seen the UK become an equal weighted market, but still, investors are not overweight the UK, whether it be perception economically, geopolitically, whether it be the quality of the companies on the index. Now, for us, we think less about the index and we think more about the individual companies. And it's clear that corporate buyers are starting to think the same as well. So whilst equity investors may be slightly reticent to move back into the UK market, others aren't. We've seen a number of bids for UK companies in the last 12 to 18 months. Sam, Sumo, Stock Spirits, Ultra Electronics, Megit, many names that feature on that list. The interesting thing has been the nature of the buyers. Yes, there are definitely some PE buyers that are involved, but we're also seeing strategic buyers of assets. EA was in a bidding war with, uh, for the Codemasters assets, Ultra Electronics going to Cobham, Megit going to Parker Hannafin. There are a number of deals where corporate buyers are looking at the value that exists within UK listed stocks, not necessarily UK listed businesses, of the UK businesses. Many of these are, are international in their outlook, but at UK valuations that are attractive. That is the opportunity in the, in the UK market right now, and others are seeing it and seizing it. And so what do we do? How do we think about the investment process in the UK? What do we, what do we look for? And again, I'm referring back to, to Stephen's previous presentation. It's not about growth versus value. It's not about the market in general. It's about stock specifics. And UK smaller companies particularly are about stock specifics. It's about understanding the drivers of these businesses, making sure that we know what moves them from where they are to where they're going to be and forgetting the noise that sits in the medium term period or near term period and thinking about the opportunity set that sits in front of us. We do this through company meetings. So we have around 800 company meetings a year. It's actually been more during COVID because the you know, facilities of Zoom and Teams mean that we can have quicker, shorter meetings, punchier, more to the point, get more out of the management teams. And we're looking to identify businesses that we will hold initially for that three to five year period, but hopefully all the way through their life cycle, passing from our smaller cap funds like the investment trust we're speaking about into our all cap and our large cap funds. Ashton again mentioned in an earlier presentation is one that has worked its way through um, our entire investment process. And so what are we looking for? Well, nothing revolutionary. You know, we're not going to pretend that we're trying to be smart about our investment philosophy. We're trying to find things that others can't find. Any of these characteristics can be identified by anyone looking at companies. But sticking rigorously and religiously to these investment processes and to these criteria, that's what really matters. It's amazing how quickly things can go wrong in small cap if you move away from this path. And at times, different ones matter. Strong management is a totally qualitative measure. It's not something you can put in numbers in terms of the strength of the management team but so, so important. Look what's happened during COVID over the last 12, 18, 24 months. Management teams who have the ability to shift their businesses rapidly, to change the direction of focus, whether it be retailers changing sales channels, or whether it be engineers having to change their supply chain and get logistics in from, from other parts of the world, get supply in from other parts of the world. You need management teams that can see those risks and those opportunities. And you need them to know what's going on on the shop floor. They can't be stuck in some ivory tower unaware of what actually is happening within their businesses. So management, vitally important. The second is market position. And market position, again, really matters. If we're looking to invest over three, five, possibly more years, we need to know there is something about what these businesses do. There is something about them that gives them market leadership. Because market leadership leads to other things. Most importantly, it leads to pricing power. You have pricing power, then the current inflationary environment we're seeing, that's less relevant to you. You can pass that on through the chain. And as long as you invest, as long as you take that super normal profit that you're getting from your pricing power and you reinvest in R&D or M&A, whatever you need to maintain that market leadership, market leadership or market position has sustainability. It doesn't change overnight. And so when we look at analyst forecasts of businesses that 
will probably implicitly have a couple of years forecasts and then revert to some three to five percent GDP plus growth rate. We are identifying businesses that can grow far in excess of that for far longer and more sustainable periods. So again, back to that earlier example of the short term versus long term in terms of where the returns come from, that short term bit, that sentiment, that bull and bear, that, that greed and fear, that doesn't matter much to us. It's about identifying that long term earnings growth and the share price performance that will inevitably follow if we prove to be correct. And track record is important here. On this presentation, on all the presentations you'll see today, the slides will say that past performance is not necessarily a guide to the future. I think when it comes to investing, it comes to identifying opportunities, I would argue it really is very, very important that the past is a very good guide to the future. Yes, businesses change. Yes, markets change. Yes, new ones come along and, and shift, uh, shift markets around and disrupt what's there. But ultimately, if a business has grown consistently in the past, there is something about that business model. There's something about the product or the service that it has that people want. And provided it maintains leadership, provided it maintains R&D, provided against the previous presentation, it maintains capex and investment, then there is no reason to believe that those businesses should lose leadership and therefore the future should look too different from the past. So track record incredibly important. And then finally, you link together cash generation and balance sheets. For us as smaller company investors where our businesses are less mature, it matters that they have strong balance sheets because there can be temporary dislocations in markets. And I'm not just talking about COVID, but there can be smaller specific things that when your business is small and niche, those tiny disruptions can have big magnified effects. So having a strong balance sheet means that investors can have patience. We can sit with a business and help them through the other side and be with them as they go through the other side without thinking whether we have to sell them because a precarious revenue and income stream leads to a precarious cash flow and precarious balance sheet. So altogether, these, these five are the investment process that we have and it's the investment process that we've had for the last 15 to 20 years. And ultimately, it leads to performance. And so if we're looking for something that does exemplify how the portfolio has run, how the portfolio has done, you can look at the last 17 years of performance. 16 of the 17 have produced positive returns. Uh, and year to date, we are positive again. We clearly had a tough COVID period, but ultimately we have demonstrated that the work that we do, the stock specific identification of opportunities that we do, the investment philosophy and thesis that we've got investing in mid to long term growth has over the years delivered positive results. And don't forget that the returns that you see here against our, our smaller companies benchmark, they augment the returns in the earlier slide of small cap versus large cap. This will be another line on top of the active return as well. So we believe that small cap is an incredibly attractive asset class within the UK. And we believe that our process over time adds performance to that as well. And so that's us. Uh, in summary, we think that people looking mid to long term in terms of their investment horizon should consider UK smaller companies as an asset class. And if you're looking at some UK smaller companies, we believe there are a number of criteria that you should follow. But ultimately, we believe that investing in growth for the mid to long term within this asset class gives good, excellent mid to long term returns.